All right, we are live. Welcome, good evening. Uh, good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, New York. Good morning. Um, welcome to our module, Emerging Fields in Architecture. Today, we have another great, interesting, innovative lesson uh, on space architecture. And I'm very glad that we have Georgi Petrov here uh, to tell you about orbital and surface habitat architecture. Georgi Petrov is a practicing architect, a structural engineer and space architect. He is a senior associate principal in the structures group at the New York office of Skidmore Owens and Merrill, Somme, New York, where he works on high rises and long span structures around the world and human habitat for planetary surfaces. He's a licensed architect and professional engineer. He's an adjunct professor at New York University and MIT, where he teaches design of tall buildings. And I'm happy that he is the vice chair of the AAA Space Architecture Technical Committee. Georgi Petrov, Georgi, hello, you are a, I'm happy to have you here as a guest again. And, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Sandra. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Uh, can you please allow sharing so I can show my slides? There you go. Now, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> today, I, I sort of um, Rather than giving a, a talk of a, a bunch of projects, we did this project and this other project, I decided to frame it around themes uh, and how through three projects mostly, but uh, rather than going through them each one, I'll go through the themes and, and that you have to address as a space architect and, and see how we approach these themes in different ways. Uh, but first, real quick about uh, Skid Morris and Merrill. Uh, we are big, uh, Architecture and Engineering Collaborative. Uh, we do all sorts of projects um, uh, and we have offices uh, throughout the world. I'm personally in New York office. I also spent some time in our Chicago office. Um, and um, uh, we are known for uh, super tall buildings. Uh, this is a little bit outdated lineup, but uh, it, uh, you know, any one point we have a big number of the world's tallest buildings that are designed and engineered by us. And uh, uh, not only we do tall buildings, but we do very innovative tall buildings, uh, which um, uh, this is kind of a lineup of the structural systems uh, that you could use to support a tall building. And uh, we're very proud that we have done the first example of this for, for many of them. Um, we also uh, are very keen on doing research uh, in very different, uh, many different types of fields in, in construction, in innovative materials, in sustainability. Um, and this is partly where our uh, uh, space architecture activities uh, uh, come in uh, as part of this uh, uh, tradition of doing research and trying to come up with in innovative technologies that will help us in our projects. Um, we do a lot of uh, uh, investigations into novel fabricating techniques that I'll talk about later. Uh, and then, uh, so this is, this is about SOM and, and sort of the background of who we are. Um, these three projects that I'll, I'll talk about, uh, one is actually on the left is my uh, Master of Architecture thesis from <laughs> a long time ago uh, in the early 2000s. Um, uh, it was a settlement on Mars. So that, that's, that's my personal project. Uh, another one is uh, um, an attempt to do an inflatable uh, for the surface um, seam, uh, surface endoskeletal inflatable module, which I did with uh, uh, one of the early and one of the probably most famous space architects, Constance Adams, uh, unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, she was very instrumental in, in establishing the field of space architecture. And then uh, most famously, our, our Moon Village project here at SOM, which we did in collaboration with the Olympiad Space Agency. Um, so to dig in, uh, first a couple of words about the Moon Village. Um, 
a lot of you have probably heard about it, but it, it was really a, uh, an idea um, that um, became popular after Jan Werner, the previous director general of the European Space Agency, kind of uh, wanted to take the, the lessons learned and the inspiration of the International Space Station and apply it to going to the moon. Uh, right? The International Space Station is a collaboration of many com countries where they all share a common infrastructure. So um, if, if one country wants to participate in space, they don't have to bring everything that they'll need. There's like a, a common infrastructure that you can plug in. Uh, for example, the European Space Agency's module uh, you know, derives its power and life support from the infrastructure already established as part of the International Space Station. So the idea of the moon village is to take this paradigm and apply it of how we want to go to the moon, you know, not as a competition, but as a collaboration where everybody can share in the same infrastructure. Uh, and so uh, in 2008, um, you know, we, we made a partnership with the European Space Agency and uh, Professor Hoffman at MIT to maybe give some architectural idea of what this moon village is, you know, uh, what does it look like and what, what could it be? Uh, and we worked on several different scales. Uh, we, you know, we started with the master plan, uh, you know, ideas of urbanism and how it could grow. Then um, we focused down and designed what the first habitat could look like. Uh, and the first habitat by definition is the one that has everything in it. <laughs> so habitation and research and, um, and, and living quarters and everything. Um, and then we actually looked into uh, the various components of the first bird, uh, habitat, you know, the, the, the shell, the connections to the, the rigid uh, thing um, structure. Uh, so we worked at these three very distinct scales, trying to give as re much reality uh, to the idea as possible. Um, and I got to say, uh, it's not just uh, uh, something that we drew uh, uh, pretty pictures, but there was a lot of rigor to it. So uh, at ESTEC, which is the, the main technical and research center of the European Space Agency, they do this thing called um, concurrent design facilities uh, um, uh, investigation, where they, they put together uh, a lot of experts, and this, this was the group, and they spent about two months going through our design uh, and you know, either critiquing it or suggesting it, how it could be actually implemented. Uh, so it's a very rigorous uh, approach. And, uh, you know, there was experts in life support and power and radiation and structural systems. And uh, we actually had a um, space architect, Marlies Arnhoff, who was uh, from the same program, a uh, student of uh, Sandra's, was on the team as well. She was working at uh, ESA, uh, so she got to comment on our um, uh, uh, project as well. And uh, because this is a, you know, publicly funded uh, Endeavor, their final report, which is about 200 pages long, is available for free off of the ESA website. Uh, if you don't want to read 200 pages <laughs> of detailed analysis, uh, we did write a summary um, for Ascend uh, 2020. Um, so uh, with this background, here's the first theme is master planning. Uh, when you want to not just go put some footsteps and come back, but you want to have a, a permanent and hopefully long-lived and expanding settlement, you have to have some idea of how you're going to lay things out. Uh, and the criteria for the, you know, the big picture criteria that you have to look at is, is mainly three things. Safety, uh, right? Uh, it's a hazardous environment. So, uh, and you're living in an enclosed space. So, you know, one key bit of it is that if there is a problem with one part of your habitat, it shouldn't cut off uh, the functioning parts from each other. So you shouldn't have any sort of single point failures that will make it impossible for people to, um, you know, go to safety. Obviously it should be an efficient layout. Uh, your everything is very expensive to get to the moon or Mars or anywhere. So you want to do uh, a settlement with as few materials as possible and it, Ideally, it should be easily expandable, um, and you should think about how it could grow into the future. And so we looked at uh, a lot of precedents. Uh, you know, how do people set up new settlements here on Earth? And you know, humans have been <laughs> roaming the planet for thousands of years. Uh, so one one very popular way to to lay out a settlement is through a grid. Uh, and then um, you know, a famous example is the Law of the Indies, which was a 
design done in Madrid uh, that guided the, all the Spanish settlements in Latin America. And so when you go to all of Latin America, you see this layout repeated over and over in the, the hearts of the cities. There's a, you know, a Plaza Mayor with the cathedral and the governor's house and then a grid expanding out. Um, same thing here in the United States. Uh, basically, uh, Thomas Jefferson laid out this uh, this act when it was enacted when he was president, and basically everything west of the Appalachia, you go you go and is on this mile by mile grid that's divided into uh, smaller and smaller segments. And all American cities, you know, in the Midwest are basically giant grids, uh, with you know a few exceptions here and there. Um, and then we looked at also, you know, other sort of radial ideas from uh, the, the radial garden city by Ebenezer Howard and uh, ideal Renaissance cities. Uh, but, uh, you know, all of these are, are not quite applicable uh, to the moon. They, they don't really uh, reflect uh, or react to topography. You know, for example, on the grid, uh, a famous example is the San Francisco streets where they just impose the grid on no matter what kind of topography they saw. And although it makes for cool car chases in movies, it's probably not the best uh, for a, an efficient <laughs> layout. You know, you, whatever your design is should adapt and, and reflect the, the natural topography in the location. And so uh, something that uh, we think is the very uh, an appropriate way to, to do uh, development is, is this idea of the linear city. Uh, it was, it was kind of maybe first expressed by our, the Spanish architect Arturo Soria. Uh, it's kind of more famous from Le Corbusier. Uh, it's, it's their idea of how do, you, how do you adapt urban planning to the industrial evolution. Um, and this idea to have uh, these linear bands of infrastructure um, connecting, in this case, uh, old cities uh, with development copying on and off of it is an efficient way to do it. Uh, you actually see this in, in uh, several, uh, you know, space architecture planning. This is uh, Guy Trotti's uh, master's thesis from the 70s. This is actually with Buckminster Fuller here. Uh, he's, um, uh, again, another early space architect. Uh, this is his design for a moon village, moon, not moon village in this case, a, a moon mission. Uh, there's a, um, a very good paper by Brent Sherwood from the early 90s uh, of how to lay out a lunar base. And again, you see uh, sort of a, a couple of linear developments in, at right angles to each other. Um, this is a, uh, a proposal for a Mars city from the 90s by this uh, Japanese construction company, Obayashi. Uh, this is a concept from a couple of years ago. And even actually yesterday, I was looking at Sandra's latest paper uh, that came out this week, and I saw this uh, uh, example of a lunar base uh, from uh, a Russian design from the 1960s. And it's again this idea of interconnected bands. Uh, you know, you could expand in either direction, and if you could lose any one module and not cut off anything else from it, you can still get to every bit of your thing. And so. Uh, I first implemented this at my master's thesis, which I called the Marx Homestead Project. Um, and there, I, you know, there's these two bands of enclosed development, and then you could sort of lay out all your programmatic elements, never mind what all the program is, uh, but, you know, labs and repair spaces and greenhouses and everything like that. And so uh, in this case, I kind of buried it in the side of a hill. So there was uh, locally constructed masonry things buried under the hill with bigger spaces and then another band of um, sort of pressurized modules that have access to the surface uh, and in section it looked like this where in and out of the page there's two bands of development and you lay out all of your uh, program around it and again it's it's easily expandable in both directions so here's the first phase for 12 people and then growing around the, the hill uh, as another 12 or uh, arrive uh, and grow on. And, you know, you can lose any one space for an accident or a fire or depreciation. You can always get to everything else and nothing is gets cut off from each other. Uh, so for the, the moon village, uh, we proposed a site on the near the South Pole and, uh, you know, the the South Pole has is, is been the most interesting bit in the last 20 years uh, over a number of missions from NASA and ESA and, and um, 
actually the Chinese Space Agency and Indian Space Agency. We have a lot of evidence that the South Pole is, is probably one of the most interesting places on the moon because, uh, you know, you have uh, frozen ice and volatiles that are both interesting scientifically because they can tell us about the origin of the solar system, but also super useful if you want to build anything and, uh, you know, any resources that you don't have to bring from Earth. Um, and you also have bits on the, the very high places where you have sunlight for large portions of the year. Um, of course, this is uh, Shackleton Crater is huge. Uh, and uh, setting up your early habitat down at the bottom is probably not very realistic. You're, you're very stuck. So, but uh, along the rim, uh, there are a few sort of local little craters where uh, uh, you, you do have uh, permanently shaded regions, so you can have access quite a bit of whatever is frozen there. Uh, but you also are not stuck in the crater and you have access to the surface. And so you could probably, you know, launch scientific operations out. Uh, uh, and you could also, if you are daring or you can figure it out, go down into the crater itself. Uh, and so our idea was to lay out these, the, the master plan of these bands. So there's a, a, a habitation band where all of the pressurized habitats are that you could both look inside the crater and then out. Uh, then there's a infrastructure band where all of the uh, you know potential ISRU or solar uh, collection or any machinery that you need to support uh, your habitat would be located. And then finally on the outside would be this sort of what we call activities band. And the idea is uh, right that uh, if you have the infrastructure build, uh, you could have many different entities come to the Moon Village. Uh, so you could have a, a government agency like ESA, and uh, if you want to have a uh, a uh, you know prepare a long trip to somewhere, you could stage it in uh, um, in this area, or right next to it could be a tourist company. And you know if you're trying to organize tourism on the moon, you're probably going to want to have like an area where people can go around and play sports and do fun activities out in the, so they, they, that's what all this type of stuff would happen outside. Um, this is zooming in a little bit. This is, we're starting to lay out uh, our, our habitats uh, in this hexagonal pattern that would eventually close itself. Then the um, uh, the band with the infrastructure and then maybe the, 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 the band with the activities where you're practicing building on the moon or, or, or doing these other things that I suggested. Uh, and then this is one of our renderings again with the habitat all grown up. In this case, the the, the crater is up to the top, uh, and the rest of the activities are down at the lower part of the rendering. Uh, and then if you look at uh, again terrestrial examples, this is the uh, uh, Scott Amutsen um, um, South Pole Station, and uh, it's it's very similar. You have your original habitat from the 50s. Uh, and then th this is the new station being constructed. Uh, again, a very linear development. Uh, and then this is all your staging area during the construction. That most of the stuff is gone now. Uh, there's another example is McMurdo. Um, this is the the biggest uh, human settlement in, in Antarctica, uh, run by the NSF. Um, so, you know, besides these three criteria of, you know, safety, efficiency, and expandability, there's got to be something else as well. Because uh, I'm sure everybody thought about, you know, how everything is laid out at McMurdo, but when you look at it, it looks like a big, you know, mess. There's no sense of place and identity. And every human settlement needs something more than just surviving, right? You need a, you need an, uh, to have some kind of iconic, iconic image. Uh, you know, if I show you this, you know, I'm sure most of you recognize immediately where that is and, and what it is. I, you know, same with uh, Vienna, you know, uh, maybe not as famous Central Park, but still something immediately recognizable uh, as an image of the city, you know, the Ringstrasse and all the beautiful parks around it. And so we were thinking that, you know, our moon village also needs something like that. And so we had this idea of leaving a part of the uh, lunar surface uh, unperturbed and un, untrodden on by tracks and and, um, and sort of a, a pristine lunar park. Uh, and we, we decided to place it in the direction of the Earth, right? On the south uh, 
pole um, of the moon, the, um, let me see if this will play, the, the earth is always sort of in one location and throughout the year it, it kind of wobbles a little bit uh, but pretty much uh, this is this is actually the exact uh, uh, location this is the uh, rim of the crater and the earth is always in that direction and so we thought it would be a really poetic uh, uh, idea to to have this this vision that you're always looking at the earth from each of the habitats and you're seeing a bit of a pristine part of the moon in front of you. And it, it'd be a beautiful view with the, the arc of the, uh, the crater rim stretching out ahead of you. So trying to add a little, you know, poetry and, and, and loveliness to, to the idea and not just be uh, about survivability and efficiency. Um, so uh, the next theme is about delivery. Uh, you know, everything that has flown so far uh, is, is especially in the early days was basically you know the the top of a rocket. Uh, so you start with the rocket, and, and you know in some cases like Skylab, it's literally the last stage of the rocket, and then you put uh, in the rocket the spaceship, and then you put all the equipment that you need uh, in the spaceship, and then the last thing that goes in there is the humans, you know, and partly that's why astronauts have to train so long is because you know, they have to adapt to this, this machinery. Uh, so anything you design these, you know, to these days still, uh, you know, fairing has gotten bigger, uh, but you, you kind of have to package whatever you're doing uh, into and fit it on top of your rocket, both in space and in mass. Uh, and so whatever you're uh, designing, you always have to kind of uh, draw the volume of your rocket and make sure whatever you're designing will fit in it. Uh, it's a little bit harder to estimate mass, but that actually even more important than the volume is, is the mass that the rocket could deliver. Uh, so for our moon village habitat, uh, this was uh, some of the images. This is usually there's some kind of an adapter that, uh, uh, that interfaces to the, to the rocket. And so um, you have to think of how your payload is gonna attach to, to the rocket cone. Uh, this is one of our renderings of our, our habitat um, uh, deflated, getting prepared to be put into um, the uh, the cone of a, of a rocket. Uh, and then uh, this is uh, part of this uh, um, uh, ESA study uh, of how we get it there. So we had to think about uh, uh, the other elements besides the habitat that are needed to transfer it from Earth to, to the lunar orbit. So we, um, we imagine that there would be actually these two uh, other spacecraft that are um, basically the infrastructure you need. One, two, that would get you from Earth orbit to lunar orbit and then transfer your habitat for, uh, to a, a lander that will take your habitat from lunar orbit down to the surface. And then these could shuttle back and forth and pick up other landers because, um, you know, you can, you know, depends on what kind of fuel and what your design is, but in order to land something on the moon, your lander is basically pretty much the size, same size as your habitat. Uh, you know, sort of a rule of thumb, uh, you know, depends on the design exactly. So we were thinking that in order to maximize the size of the habitat and, and, and allow for most space for the, the habit, the humans, uh, we should uh, take all of the machinery needed to get it there, and that would be a separate uh, entity flying it there, so that that way you don't have to lose half of your space uh, for just to deliver your habitat. Uh, and then this is this is kind of the the sequence of events. You launch it on, on a hopefully reusable rocket uh, in Earth orbit. It would get picked by the cycler, which would take it to lunar orbit and then transfer it to a lander, which would then land it somewhere away from your settlement. Uh, and then you have to bring it to its final position. And our thinking there is that, uh, you know, as optimistic as we want to be, you're probably not bringing new habitats very often to your cellular or settlement anytime soon, right? Maybe you know, <laughs> if you're lucky once a year, twice a year. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's, it's not worthwhile to have a dedicated uh, you know, truck that just does that. 
So maybe uh, you could use your rover that you're using to explore the moon. And then once a year, when it needs to bring a new habitat, you would attach a crane attachment and maybe some really simple dumb truck. And you would come uh, pick it up from your lander and then drive it and install it in its final position. So we, we kind of try to think uh, through all of these steps and what it would take to, to get the habitat from the earth to your final position in your master plan. Mm. There's other ideas of how to get things there. Uh, you know, the last two uh, Mars rovers have uh, landed with uh, this sky crane idea, which uh, seemed pretty crazy until it was carried out flawlessly twice. Uh, it can maybe adapt it. Uh, this is a, uh, some renderings from maybe the 90s or maybe even the 80s of an idea of how to do this uh, sky crane idea for a rover or a habitat so you could have some some ideas like that again uh, this is a, some piece of infrastructure that you can reuse many times rather than just once landing it like they did in Apollo uh, and then this is a vision from the, the, the seam project where you've landed somewhere with a sky crane maybe and now you're towing um, your habitat to the final placement. In this case, we were proposing a, a sort of a um, unpressurized rover, but you know, there's lots of options for that. Um, and then, uh, what are the the things you're bringing? Right, if you have to uh, make everything fit inside the your rocket, uh, what are your options? So, uh, you know, all of the international station is these. Uh, pressurized cans because they're they're designed to fit either into the proton rocket or to the space shuttle's bay. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's this very famous uh, example of the TransHab project, which is trying to come up with an idea of, well, what can you do so you're not confined to this volume? Um, and then, uh, you know, Constance Adams, who I mentioned, was uh, one of the key architect designers on this project. Um, from the mid '90s, um, so the idea is to have a, a rigid uh, central core, which can withstand the very high loads of launch. Uh, but once you get it on orbit, you can then inflate a shell out of it, and you you gain a lot of new volume uh, that you could use for, and you're not restricted to the small volume inside the the cone of the rocket. Uh, you know, they, they, it was quite well developed. Uh, they, they, they tested some engineering modules. The the shell uh, is 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 probably something that's quite thick. It has many many layers. One layer that holds the pressure. Lots of insulation layers. Lots of bladders that to hold the atmosphere, an interior uh, sort of finish, an exterior micrometeor sheet. So all of these inflatables are pretty thick uh, thick layers. Uh, this is an example of this, the scale that they tested it in this vacuum chamber in Houston at full scale. You can see the people down here preparing it. Uh, the ropes are there to simulate, uh, you know, microgravity and so on. Uh, so in the years since uh, TransHab, there have been a lot of people doing a lot of research on, uh, you know, in, inflatables. Uh, these are uh, some full scale mock-ups by um, uh, Bigelow uh, uh, company. Uh, they actually managed to get one in orbit. So currently, uh, there is a inflatable module attached to the International Space Station. Uh, they mostly use it for storage, uh, and and I guess it's research, but it is up there right now as we speak at the SS. Uh, the last couple of years, Sierra Nevada has uh, uh, taken up the torch in carrying the uh, the research forward. So this was a uh, a module that they built, I think, a couple of years ago, uh, full scale, and it fitted it out with uh, a mock-up uh, of the interior. Uh, in fact, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, they had a, a video I saw where they did a, an engineering module where they inflated it until it exploded. Uh, so that's a pretty cool thing you can look up. Uh, on the, uh, you know, this was the uh, our attempt to to adapt the idea of transhab from microgravity to the surface uh, seam. So again, taking this idea of having two, two bulkheads uh, with some rigid elements in the middle. And then for launch, you would pack all of your panels that are floors or, or walls around it 
to create a very stiff, torsionally stiff uh, object that when you are launching it in the rocket uh, is, is very stable. And then when you get it on the surface and inflate, you can fold all these panels out to, to become your architecture. Uh, and so um, these were some, some ideas of how one could lay it out uh, as in a horizontal fashion with uh, some areas for uh, life support and, and mechanical systems, um, trying to reconcile uh, uh, the curving volume with the flat floors uh, and all sorts of ideas. And uh, I'm by, by me, no means the only one thinking about this. A lot, of, a lot of people are putting a lot of thought about it. This is how you could start putting them together. Uh, on the Moon Village project, we, we again tried to come up with something new to say in this. So uh, again, the same idea that if you have the, the fairing and you put there your rigid capsule, you, you basically have this volume to work with. And then on Transhab, we have the fairing and the rigid um, central core. And then once you get on orbit, you could expand and get a lot more volume but uh, all of your habitable space is basically this sort of donut and you're always kind of walking around a corner. So for our uh, uh, moon village, we, we thought, what if we place the, uh, the rigid structure on the perimeter uh, and then when you inflate uh, on, on these three pedals, uh, then your middle is really free. So you get a nice, continuous space to, to do the architecture in rather than trying to be always around the corner. Uh, and so this is how we laid it out in this three-part uh, um, design. Uh, in each of the floors, uh, the center is, is uh, either circulation or usable space, uh, and all of the activities are on the site, so in creating this sort of continuously nicely used space. Um, we laid up all the volumes uh, with uh, in, on four floors in this case. Uh, the, as I said, uh, this was, uh, we were kind of designing what would be the first one. So by definition, it had to have everything in it. Uh, so the ground level is a um, access to airlocks and to other tunnels, to other uh, future habitats, uh, exercise and maintenance of your spacesuits and uh, activities. The, the second floor would be a, a research lab. Uh, third floor where, where, where the main um, uh, crew quarters uh, and, and food service. And then the top uh, we left as a, um, a sort of a, a research garden uh, and a sort of a bio lab. And I'll get to talk about that in a second as well. Um, you know, this is some of the views of the interior of the, with all of the continuous space in the middle rather than always on the side. Uh, and again, we thought of uh, what the, the rigid bit with it all folded and how the this was one idea of how the floors could expand. Um, we also, uh, because we are we have this a little bit more complex geometry, we did a lot of studies of what the actual inflated shell will be. Uh, you know, by definition, a, a tension member can only take forces in its tension and no bending. Um, and so we, we were trying to, to verify that we get the right shape that we found. Um, the idea is that you know later as you grow and bring in more of them, just like a, a settlement on earth, you would start to differentiate. So maybe you have one habitat that's entirely for a lab and another one uh, with more sophisticated crew quarters and entertainment, maybe another one just for storage and so on and so forth. Um, so another theme is symbiosis. And um, if you look at uh, our ideas of science fiction and our science fiction books and a lot of our science fiction movies, it's always, right, humans and their machines going out to take over the world, <laughs> the universe. And, uh, you know, the, the, you know, you might say, well, Georgi, wait a second, these are all military vessels. But if you, <laughs> if you dig around for other, uh, you know, more permanent habitats, again, it's always, you know, humans in this very machine you know, metal and plastic world. But, um, and this is, this is a little bit how it is in the ISS. Uh, this is basically all of the life support system in the, in the racks of the ISS. Uh, but if you're planning to live a, a long time, it really, we should start thinking of humans, their machines, yes, but also other species and mostly other species of plants. 
And so uh, there's already research like this. Uh, uh, this is an ESA um, project to try to incorporate, uh, you know, part of part of the life support system to be biologically driven, driven, and you know, in this case, algae to try help purify the water and the, the air. But this idea is is really important. There's you know a lot of people are thinking about how you know how would you make a garden there so it's it's not just uh, gray metal but also uh, other species and plants. And you know uh, we do we're starting to do some research in ISS uh, you know lettuce and and um, tomatoes and then this was uh, almost a year ago they had the first harvest of peppers and it was a a big event, you know, seeing something fresh and smelling it and, and tasting fresh food is super important psychologically uh, as well. Uh, so uh, part of, you know, my thesis was like, uh, I showed you this, like laying out in the bands, but then each of the different spaces had a different attitude of how you would uh, incorporate greenery into it. Like, for example, at the crew quarters, you would reserve uh, a, a space where everybody could grow a few plants and you're always kind of looking at uh, uh, the alien world through the greenery in front of your window. Um, also had this idea of, uh, you know, the first tree, uh, you know, every time a crew arrives at the ISS, they all gather together and take a picture. So I was thinking that, well, maybe um, there could be a symbolic plant that uh, every new arrival would have their picture taken with it and would grow with, uh, with the habitat. You know, the ideas like that. Uh, at, at the Moon Village, uh, we dedicated the top floor uh, for, I mean, this is not enough uh, space to feed the crew. You know, you can, you can imagine it like on Earth, right? Uh, the area covered by food production is much bigger than the settlement that it's supporting. Uh, so in this case, it would be more for, you know, learning how to grow plants on the Moon, but also for as a psychological escape and uh, a relief. <clears throat> a similar theme is light and color. Uh, you know, on Earth, we're used to the changing of the seasons and the vibrant colors. Uh, but on the moon, it's, it's, it's just gray. Uh, and then even if you, we make it to Mars, uh, it's not gray, it's red. But again, <laughs> it's the same color, but monotonous everywhere. Um, and it's not just the color, but the changes of light throughout the day. Uh, uh, it, it gives a, a sense of rhythm and, and change, which is important to humans. If you plot a, a typical Earth day, the light temperature, there's a lot of variations. While you know, on the ISS, you basically turn on the lights or turn them off, and it's the same color intensity throughout the day. And you lose a sense of, of the time passing and the, the cycles of life. And so, um, this was a, uh, a proposal for a, a pavilion that, uh, for our, our moon village design. And we had this idea of, of playing with the light. So and maybe in the morning, the light would wash on the walls from the bottom and be sort of this warm sunrisey light. Throughout the day, you would switch it. So the light would be become uh, wider, um, brighter, and come up from the top. Maybe you could cycle it back in the evening to warmer colors. So. Uh, if you're pr proposing designs for, for outer space, even, you know, make sure you think about the, the light and the color of the light and where it's coming from and, and how it could vary throughout the day and throughout the season. Uh, recently, people are thinking a lot about uh, projections and uh, augmented reality as well. So that, that's an option that's being explored uh, by various people. This is a paper from a couple of years ago. This is the high seas uh, uh, Mars simulation in Hawaii. And uh, somebody was thinking of how you could either project on the wall or maybe through wearing glasses, you could project and, and, and have a sense of uh, changing colors rather than just having your drab uh, closing off of your uh, habitat. Uh, another thing that's important to think is radiation. Uh, you know, on, on Earth, we're happily here protected by the Earth's atmosphere and magnetic field. Uh, and although our sun, makes all life possible our sun is also uh pretty dangerous uh so there's there's three main sources of radiation there's the solar wind which is kind of constant 
uh, low level radiation. There's galactic cosmic rays, uh, which uh, there's very little you could do about. They're basically particles moving near the speed of light. And here on Earth, they're mostly stopped, not by the magnetic field, but by the atmosphere. And then there's periodically uh, the sun has these magnetic storms and spews large amount of plasma out uh, that solar flares, uh, which are quite deadly. Fortunately, they're predictable and they take about an hour or two to reach the Earth's vicinity. So you kind of can plan for them. Uh, it's kind of like space weather. You know, you gotta, you gotta be always vigilant, but you could do something about those. Uh, this is an image uh, of, of the eclipsed sun and you could see one of these uh, protrusions up. You know, mo most of these spew out and don't hit the Earth, right? There's a lot of volume and space where they could go, so. Uh, early examples, people were kind of pr proposing burying and covering stuff in regolith. That's sort of a common theme. Uh, you know, these days with uh, 3D printing being in vogue, people are proposing 3D printing shelters. Um, a cool idea from NASA Eames uh, uh, Center is to maybe uh, take all of this uh, life uh, support and especially the water purification system. And what if it's not a box that you just keep somewhere like on the ISS, but what if it's in these thin pouches that are all interconnected and they could always become uh, a wallpaper and you put them all around their habitat. Um, one thing that's um, really good at stopping radiation is materials that have hydrogen in them. And, you know, lo and behold, uh, water is mostly hydrogen and you're gonna need water uh, anyway and you're going to need it treated. So why not treat it in such a way that's also providing part of your radiation protection? You can put it all around it. Um, people have also proposed, um, you know, covering it in uh, ice, uh, you know, any, on the moon or on Mars. Uh, if you have uh, a lot of available water, you can do this. Uh, I'm always a little bit uh, skeptical about this because even though it's very cold, uh, locally, uh, you you know, if you're exposed to the sun, you can get pretty high temperatures in certain moments. So keeping your thing always frozen might be a challenge. You need to at least think about it. Um, back to the Mars settlement, uh, um, the, I had the idea that if you have a masonry system uh, on Mars, the, the physics works out that you need about 10 meters of soil regolith to balance the atmospheric pressure to keep it from exploding. Uh, and then if you're on the side of the hill, you're down at the front where the atmospheric pressure is contained in vessels, you just need a few meters of regolith to protect you from the radiation. Uh, for the Moon Village project, this is again from the, uh, the research at ESA, uh, they proposed a couple of things. You know, one is burying our habitat, which we you know, did not want to do. Uh, and the other one is providing sort of a, a hardened location um, so this, this would be good uh, for protection from the solar flares. You would basically get a, about an hour's worth of warning and you could get all of the crew into this hardened area where you get the protection from the solar flare. And once it passes, everybody could go back and you know do their business. And because on the lunar south, uh, south pole, the sun is always on the horizon, all this radiation would be coming horizontally at you. So this is why we were proposing this kind of wall uh, around the base of the habitat. And, and we imagine that this could be maybe 3D printed. So you would bring your inflatable habitat inflated and then 3D print using the local regolith, uh, your sort of hardened protection against solar uh, flares uh, is one, one sort of an idea. Uh, if we're going to be doing all this cool stuff, uh, we also need power. Uh, this is not something you really it's not a really architectural program. Uh, so um, it's more like you have to address it and leave it at that. And, uh, you know, if you look at the ISS, a large area of it is, is the power generation system. Uh, the solar panels are, you know, as big as the rest of the, <laughs> the station. Uh, anywhere further out, uh, you know, like the Voyager spacecraft or even these days on Mars, um, you know, you, the sun is a lot weaker, so a, uh, a, a nuclear reactor is, is the way to go. And on, on Voyager is this thing, and on the 
the the latest two rovers because uh, it's 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 this bit, and uh, NASA does have a um, a prototype for a uh, nuclear fission power plant. And from an architectural point of view, it's just say, okay, we put this, you know, 100 meters and we bury it. And then, uh, you know, you run a cable and you have power. Uh, but, you know, on, on the South Pole of the moon, part of the reason to go there is that you do have a lot of sun. Uh, not Nowhere is it 100%. There, they, we, people call them the peaks of eternal light, but it's not quite eternal. It's, <laughs> it's in the... The most uh, sunlit places, it's usually you know eighty percent of the year, and it, it kind of varies depending on the orbit. But anyway, again, you would you would do sort of vertical oriented uh, solar panels, and uh, the problem here becomes is how do you keep them from shading each other, and how do you do an uh, efficient? So, actually, uh, this researcher Eric Halbach uh, from um, Tam he used to be at Tampere University, uh, wanted to investigate this and, and called us over and asked if we could use the Moon Village as a precedent. So we actually wrote two papers with him of uh, investigating what is the best geometry to, to lay out a vertically oriented uh, solar, um, solar panel. This is uh, a, a prototype NASA design. I think it's from um, uh, JPL. Uh, so we took that area and we, we kind of played around with various geometries and saw throughout the, the year what the best orientation. And then we came back and said, well, okay, what, what if you can move them up and down? So they don't, what, you know, what's the best arrangement uh, for them? Uh, so uh, I guess not strictly architecture, but an interesting thing that we did uh, in addition to our uh, master planning efforts. Um, and then there's uh, construction. You got to build stuff. Uh, there's a uh, classification system that I think Mark Cohen started maybe in the 90s uh, of how to classify habitats. Um, class one is a pre-integrated, uh, basically everything is ready, put in the rocket, you send it and it's good to go. And you know the lunar module of Apollo would be an example of that. Uh, class two would be modular system that you have to put together uh, over a long time and, you know, mirror in the International Space Station, all like that. And then uh, class three would be, you know, uh, things you've built there on, on your destination using local materials. And we, we don't have really any examples of that yet. Um, and when you, uh, when you think about constructing, it's really... Uh, the main thing you have to think about is containing pressure. And just as an example, the floor you're sitting on right now on Earth, uh, we usually design it for, you know, 50 to really 100 PSF or in, in metric units, like two to five, maybe 10, if it's something really heavy KPA. Trying to contain uh, one atmosphere at sea level is basically 10 times more force. So 2000 PSF or about 100 KPA. And even if you say, well, maybe we don't need to do sea level, maybe we could do, you know, uh, Potosi, Bolivia, for example, is the highest city on earth uh, that's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And, and there the atmospheric pressure is only 60%, but it's still an order of magnitude bigger. So, um, you know, you could, um, uh, you have to, that's why everything on, that you see is, is sort of this bulbous thing trying to take this amount of pressure in bending is very super inefficient. So that's why you never should have like big flat areas of, of stuff that's containing pressure. Uh, and back, back when I was starting to think about space architecture, we really had, you know, in, inflatables were, or rigid vessels were, were the things you could, you could bring from earth and, um, you know, stacking masonry was uh, a, another sort of idea of ISRU. And you can actually build, this is a, a pretty cute image from uh, an Iranian architect, Hassan Fati. Uh, um, you could actually build vaults, uh, and this is a technology from thousands of years ago without any scaffolding or centering, so it's pretty efficient. You can kind of lean uh, successive arches on previous ones, so you, you don't need infrastructure. You basically need a, uh, something to guide the geometry. You can do the same thing with domes. And uh, actually, uh, this was my first project after graduating. I, uh, there's the uh, Mars Desert Research Center that's run by uh, 
the Mars Society out in Utah. And it's, it's used uh, to this day. There's currently a crew there right now. It's now 20 some years that they're doing simulations. And so I was part of Crew 22. Uh, and one of the projects I brought is like, what can we do in simulation to build a Mars vault? So, you know, we collected our locally sourced material in our pressurized rover. Uh, we mixed uh, cement, and this is our guide rope to guide our geometry. <laughs> we built a vault. Uh, this is us afterwards. Uh, it's done. Uh, and you know, here is your class one pre-integrated habitat that you brought from Earth, and you're building your permanent settlement with ours. <laughs> so you know, uh, uh, obviously, uh, this is a little bit of a, a not the realistic way to do it. You uh, any minute. Uh, of any humans on the moon would be super scripted and pressure uh, pre precious. So, you know, you wouldn't try to do this in, in spacesuit. There's ideas to do a temporary pressurized um, sort of construction tent where you could work in short sleeve environment at least. But in reality, I kind of think of it as as on Earth, right? When you try to build a masonry structure, you have the master mason lay out the geometry, and then you have the apprentice come in and fill out the boring you know, work. And so this is a project we did here at, uh, at SOM in collaboration with Princeton University uh, to do a, um, a, a glass uh, brick structure using a coordination of two robots working together. Um, this was actually an exhibit we, we built, uh, they built it in situ in London. Unfortunately, the exhibit, they finished the vault in the first week of March of 2020. And then uh, you know, the world shut down two weeks later. Uh, so, so we couldn't uh, share it in person, but we're sharing it now. So I, I really think if we do something like that, it would really be a collaboration with, uh, with uh, robots and, and the humans guiding them. Uh, here's our vault like that it was built by two robots. Uh, this is another uh, um, research by a, a colleague of mine who used to be here and now is at ETH Zurich. Uh, trying to get two robots to work together to build a, a vault uh, using uh, masonry units, another, another possibility. Uh, but in the, really in the last 10 years, uh, it's been uh, 3D printing uh, has really come of, uh, of age. Uh, and there, there's a lot of uh, different projects. This was a project we did with the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers to 3D print in concrete, a quickly deployable structure uh, NASA has had these uh, 3D printing challenges. This was in the first phase one. Uh, uh, Search Plus won this with a uh, 3D printed uh, water ice uh, structure for Mars. Uh, this was, uh, again, uh, their winning entry for the next phase, uh, 3D printing in regolith. Um, this was proposing to pre-tension it uh, so that it could hold uh, the pressure while not putting uh, the 3D printed material in tension. Uh, this is another one uh, recent, again, a collaboration with ICON and Search Plus for the moon. Uh, in, in reality, I think uh, 3D printed, uh, is whether you're printing in regolith or anything else, the, the way the, the, the technology works where you're adding things, you do have a lot of strength along the extrusion, but very far less cohesion across your layers. So uh, trying to, to 3D print something that will hold uh, one atmosphere of pressure seems very challenging. So I think the first experiments would be stuff like this, where you could you know, 3D print the foundation or 3D print something that's not really holding pressure and not terribly sophisticated. Uh, so uh, you know, for our moon village, we propose that the foundation be 3D printed using regolith, so that way you don't have to bring any legs or anything like that from Earth. Uh, you know, and if you think about it, uh, laying weld is basically depositing a little bit of molten metal at a time. And if you put a, a welding torch on a uh, on a robot, you could 3D print in steel. And so, um, uh, you know, two years ago we we got invited to, by the Venice Biennale to build uh, one of these modules. Um, so this was obviously not going to be a pressurized uh, <laughs> module, but like as, as realistic as we could make it um, for the Venice Biennale. And, and we partnered with MX3D, uh, which is this uh, 3D printed steel company out of Amsterdam. 
they're quite famous for this bridge of theirs. Uh, this is their, their their queen opening it, and they even brought one of their little robots to show it. Um, but um, we we wanted to 3D print in steel one of the floors. So this is the the layout of our habitat with the circulation space in the middle and the supports at the corners. And we did this uh, topology optimization study to see where the best place is to put the material. So when you when you run it, it kind of takes away the part that's not really doing anything and adds material to where it's most efficient. Uh, obviously, you can't really take this and 3D print it. So we had to go through several uh, steps of rationalizing it, uh, but being inspired by the geometry that the optimization uh, suggested. Uh, and then we had to work a lot to make it uh, 3D printable so to to adapt to the actual process. For example, you know, you can't lay molten metal in free air. You have to, there was a limit of 35 degrees from the vertical that you could lay it and it will still stand. Uh, and so we also did a lot of studies of uh, the reach of the robots that uh, MX3D had and what are the sequence of 3D printing uh, that we could do. Uh, so we made sure everything fit within the reach of the robot. Uh, and could be 3D printed. And then we had this uh, typical frame outside. Uh, and when we did several iterations to make it even more efficient because they could, they could 3D print in different thicknesses. And we, uh, we played around with the depth of the geometry to further optimize it. Uh, and this is how it would have fit. Uh, this is what it looks like up close, uh, the different uh, layers of the weld uh, on top of each other. And they actually 3D printed the whole thing uh, unfortunately, COVID kind of uh, ruined our plans a little bit, so we couldn't put together the, the habitat uh, for various reasons. So at the last minute, uh, we actually uh, had to re <laughs> rearrange our plan. So we, we did end up with a big uh, model of our Moon Village plan and a, a big uh, uh, model of one of the habitats and uh, a video which I think we're out of time, but I can send a link to Sandra. It's a pretty cool video that's narrated by Jeff Hoffman, a former astronaut uh, of our Moon Village design. And uh, these are some screen captures from the video. And the last bit I'll, I'll leave you with uh, is currently in Milano, we have an exhibit at the Triennale of Milano uh, to kind of follow up on this. And they, they asked us to, uh, to put uh, a decalogue or, or 10 things that space architects need to um, think about. Uh, so 10 themes. So these themes that I'm, I've been talking are, are a few of them. I didn't cover every single one of them here, uh, but it's then, then we, we also produce these uh, uh, short little videos that are trying to illustrate the issue without telling you what the solution is. And so this is uh, open until, uh, early January in, in Milan. If anybody happens to be near there, I don't know where you guys are all over the world, but it's there. Uh, I think with that, I'll, I'll call it a day. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, I'll just do a, maybe a, a plug here uh, that I'm sure Sandra has, uh, has told you about, but uh, um, you know, there's, if you're interested in, in further talking to space architects, uh, after you finish, you know, there is the Space Architecture Technical Committee of the AIAA and Sandra is the current chair and I'm the vice chair. And we, we do hold a lot of events. Uh, we do have three conferences every year where we sponsor space architecture uh, talks. Uh, they, they, they all move. And then every once in a while, we, we sponsor a full day event somewhere uh, where uh, we gather as many space architects as possible and we, we can share our thoughts and, and, and collaborate. We just had one uh, a couple of uh, months ago in uh, Paris. Uh, so with that, I think I can, I see a lot of people are texting in the, uh, in the questions. Sander, should I read through there or do you wanna ask in uh, people to ask live? I can't hear. Uh, we can't hear you. I can't hear you, Sandra. <clears throat> Do I 
use the chat. Uh, does it work? Yes, yes. It works. Okay, I, I have a different. Good. Uh, thank you. I don't know what happened. Okay, uh, Julian Tesche is working on his diploma. He is uh, he came here for the module, but he's also working on the diploma. So his questions are probably more into the field of space architecture than the others. Julian, please start. So I'm not too sure about that, but I would like to start. Um, when I saw your master thesis, I wondered that you used some ortho orthogonal structures, like rectangular structures. And maybe it was because of those sections, but I wondered if it if you did it on purpose, like you wanted to have some yeah, human-like rooms or maybe... So the, uh, uh, on that one, uh, the orthogonal ones are the ones that are uh, buried deep in the um, under the regolith. So the, the idea was there was that the weight of the regolith is uh, balancing the pressure. So then you don't really need uh, to have the... Uh, the uh, uh, walls be taking uh, force and tension, and so you could have rectilinear. I, uh, I, I also um, was, you know, this was 20 years ago, where <laughs> a robotic construction and 3D printing were very much in its infancy. So I was thinking that it would be simpler to build a straight wall with a robot than than uh, something more uh, uh, interesting architecturally. That that's kind of what what the thinking was. Uh, if I had to redo this these days, I would not cons constrain myself for it. I think with uh, AI and, and uh, robotic learning and uh, 3D printing have advanced enough that you shouldn't be constrained to straight lines. But the uh, important thing is that if, if whatever you're drawing is containing the pressure, then, uh, then you definitely cannot have uh, big flat surfaces. Uh, because the the amount of uh, pressure to hold an atmosphere is so big that anything in bending is going to be super inefficient. Uh, so so if you if whatever you're drawing is the structural layer that's containing the pressure, it has to be taking it in tension. So it has to be either like a cylinder or a curve or, or something. That okay. that's the only way to do something to hold uh, one atmosphere and be light enough. Okay, I see. So, but at this time, you thought it would be nice to have some rectangular rooms, which allow to yeah, maybe feel yeah, a bit I, like I, home. Or I thought it'd be easier to construct, and since since they're not containing the pressure, the pressure is balanced by the earth and could be straight walled. Okay, I see. Another question I had, I was when you showed uh, the... Julian. May I add something to this one because we sure. talked about experimenting last lectures and. Uh, well, Georgi showed the project where he built the wall when he was in his beginnings, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say I'd like to add that it's very important to take any opportunity you get and experiment. You know, and don't. It's not necessary to think of fancy solution. It's important to just try things out. And I would also like to add that building a wall, even without a spacesuit, with just uh, stones and earth, a straight wall is not easy. And I'm not sure if everybody can do that. Okay, thanks. Okay, another question I had was when you showed the Moonville chap that you had like the garden on the top floor where you had like plants and pots and I found that to be somehow weird because usually all the greenhouses in space are like in drawers or like are really yeah more like technical. And so I was wondering if it was just like a recreational room for you or if you really had a mind to use it as a biological life support system. Well, um, I think it was more for experimenting, uh, growing with plants. So it'd be kind of like the, the ISS, right? They do have, they are making experiments growing plants they're very contained, uh, very isolated. The, uh, you know, you need a lot of plants to actually clean air for four people or five people or whatever. So the, um, 
the idea that this would be your main lab support is probably unrealistic until you build a lot bigger greenhouses and you figure out how to do that. Uh, but just the, the psychological uh, act of taking care of plants is, I think, something that's very helpful in and of itself. The, um, the, I mean, I'll be a little bit honest. The one, one thing that came out of uh, the technical study with the European Space Agency is that uh, four floors was is maybe a little bit too heavy. I think uh, the mass that we arrived with was like, you know, 15 or 16 tons. Uh, so one of the recommendations was to be either make it a three story module or, or maybe split it into two two story modules to make it lighter. Uh, you know, taking 15 tons to the surface of the moon is, is a pretty, <laughs> pretty challenging bit. Uh, so if I, I were to do a, a another iteration, I would probably rethink a little bit that last uh, floor. Uh, but that was just what, you know, one example. There's, I, I, I kind of, my goal here was to give you themes and get you thinking, but you, you should think of how you would best uh, introduce plants into your design. Uh, uh, but I, I think, don't think of it that you'll be feeding uh, uh, everybody with a little, uh, you know, experimental greenhouse. It's, it's not like, it's not the main supply of clean air or food. It's more supplemental, you know, it's like these six peppers that they grew in the ISS. It's something to celebrate, not your main sustenance, you know. Okay, so you think it's like not in the first habitat, so maybe later on when we have class, not in the first class habitat. three if it's okay, I see. The last question is, um, have you considered using algae in your habitat? Um, maybe you answered it in the, before when you said it, or maybe it could be too heavy to bring so much water to maybe shield your inhabitants from radiation with water and maybe algae yeah. in this water, but have you considered well, the it? The Melissa it... project that I showed, uh, is a life support experiment uh, and this, uh, the water wall from uh, NASA Eames, they all use uh, algae in some way to uh, clean the, the water as part of the, I, I don't remember off the top of my head the exact biology and the steps for it, but the idea is to use algae to, you know, cycle your water. And then uh, I think in both of them, the idea is that you can actually eat it to part of it if it grows too much. Uh, so it's, it's both cleaning the water. Uh, I mean, it is, it is green. Uh, it, uh, it, you know, that picture that I showed with the baggie looks kind of slimy, but it, at the Biennale last year, there was a, uh, not space related, but uh, a, another project uh, using algae to filter water that was done very artistically and beautifully. So that, you know, there's space for design and, 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 and vision in, in that. So the algae is definitely one of the first things you would use. Okay, but you also ditched it because it's like the first habitat. You think it's too complicated because it's. Uh, uh, what was I mean, the some reason of these why things you... yeah, up there could be algae. I mean, we we didn't get into the detail of uh, programming every plant and stuff like that. But um, I I I I mean, the early experiments here are definitely with algae. So whatever you're doing uh, up there, some of it would probably be definitely be that. Okay, but against radiation, you also didn't consider water. Like you showed off the the walls and the lower levels which you printed, but I mean, there's also water. Uh, but the, I think the uh, the top of the if you do a uh, let me see where it was. Sorry. The uh, we did say that the the top bit of it would be water. Okay, so yeah. Uh, in our in our section in between the floors, there's all this cavity where you would run all of the life support uh, and all the pipings and stuff like that. So you could put a lot of storage between the ground floor and the, the second floor. And that could be uh, where the most of the water treatment is happening. So it provides the cap, uh, you know, because the sun is mostly horizontal, but sometimes it rises a little bit higher as well. So okay, I see. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Ben, it's you. Yeah, uh, I was wondering uh, what kind of insulation you use for the habitats. Uh, you showed this slide where you um, yeah, expand the walls and uh, I was wondering what kind of insulation you use and if like 
mycelium that could grow into those gaps would be an option. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of papers recently uh, trying to come up with uh, ways to use uh, different uh, um, mushroom type things. Uh, uh, the ones for transhab, I actually can't think uh, off the top of my head what the name of the material is. It's some kind of a foam. Um, and the, the main thing from an architectural point of view that you have to worry about is it's thick. Uh, when, you, when you're drawing your uh, inflatable shell, if you want to explore inflatables, uh, make sure you leave at least, uh, you know, 6, 30, 40, maybe half a, you know, 50 centimeters of thickness, because the, the inflatable shell is, is doing a lot of things. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a, the layer that actually structurally holding the atmosphere, that's really thin. Uh, that's usually made of uh, uh, Kevlar or um, uh, Vectran is the new, it's a brand name. It's basically a, a, a plastic um, extruded uh, filament. But the, the insulation layers are pretty thick. Uh, and then the, you need uh, a micrometeorite protection layer on the outside in case you something hits it. And then on the inside, you have some kind of a, you know, finishing, architectural finishing, but the whole thing it's pretty fat. I, I don't know what the exact material for the installation is, but mm. when you're drawing it in your section and plans, make sure you leave a nice, <laughs> a nice thick area for it because you're going to need it. Okay. I mean, it wouldn't be probably an option for the first ones as well, because obviously you need to, the first one can't grow, but um, yeah, maybe the, the third or something, you can start with building the insulation on the spot. With mycelium because it doesn't take space to bring it up, like it's growing. Yeah, yeah. You know? so it might be nice. That's a very, very good idea, and, and uh, uh, it, if you want to explore that, that's a very good thing to to do. It's very plausible. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Um, maybe we can add here, Georgi, that um, what, and sometimes even more problem is to get rid of the heat. Uh, it's not that oh, yeah. it gets too warm, but you have to get rid of the heat that you produce because of the vacuum. Yes, 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 exactly. Let me I have a sli slide we could show that really nicely. Um, if you uh, if you look at the ISS, uh, the uh, you know, the solar panels are these that generate electricity, but uh, all of these elements outside, uh, these guys and these guys, uh, they're not as big as the solar panels, but they're pretty big. And they're all the, uh, the elements that reject uh, heat out. Uh, because uh, on, on Earth, right, you do most of it through convection and, and con you know, conduction, uh, like you, you let the air in and out of the building and you circulate it. There's, you can't do that <laughs> in vacuum. And uh, the vacuum is actually a, a perfect insulator. That's how a thermos works, right? The thermos is two layers with vacuum in it. So the only way to get rid of heat is through radiation. And so that's why you have to have these big panels uh, to reject heat out. So that's a very good point. Uh, we actually didn't don't, don't draw any of that on, on the, uh, the moon village thing, but you would have besides the solar panels you will have something like this it's it's panels that run ammonia in them i think uh a loop uh and then they re reject the heat so that's a very good point thank you very much nicolas yes um, my first question actually directly connects to uh, my colleagues um you talked about like building underground um uh, so I was thinking that maybe a lot of the problems you talked about, especially radiation and maybe um, insulation could be solved by that. But it also seems very difficult to do because you said that it needed to be like 10 meters deep, um, probably because the soil is so light. So I was thinking, does it actually help shielding against radiation at this depth or is like the soil too fine for that? And also, as Sandra just said, it will, will be a problem then for like exchanging the heat inside probably, I guess. 
So what are the pros and cons of that concept? Because water, of course, will um, bring a lot of weight um, if you have to bring it up into space. So the soil is already there, so that would be a pro, but on the other hand, it seems too difficult to, to build it on the spot, actually. No, that, that's a good point. So a uh, couple of thoughts on that. Um, to, to protect against uh, solar flares, uh, I mean, it's not quite a definite answer, but you need a, maybe a, a meter or two of, of uh, local regolith. And if it has water in it, it's probably less, uh, you know, already. So that's part of the reason of going to the South Pole on the moon. The idea, because mm -hmm. the idea is that there's water there and you can just use that. Uh, if you're just using uh, ice blocks, 100% water, then it might be even less than that, like half a meter of it. Um, the math uh, was for uh, the 10 meters was for Mars, which has twice the gravity of, of the moon. Uh, and, okay. and it was for 60% uh, of the Earth's, uh, of the sea level atmospheric pressure. So on the moon, if you want to hold the pressure using just the gravity of the regolith, it'd be huge. I, don't, I haven't done the math, <laughs> you know, maybe 20 meters. So uh, that becomes not very realistic uh, on the moon uh, to try to bury it, to, to protect it, uh, to, to balance the pressure. Um, but to it also you know you're expending all this effort to send humans to the moon you don't want to bury them where they don't see the moon so it kind of defeat the purpose right there's i didn't bring uh, one of the other themes that are in the triennale that i didn't cover here is the need for windows uh, and there's a, a very big literature and documentation that you need to be able to see outside and the cupola on the iss is the most popular and photogenic thing and everybody loves it and so um there's a, a lot of research on the proposals to do habitats in lava tubes where it's already built and to go in. Uh, problem is that um, they're not usually where you want to be. Uh, you know, we, we found some evidence for three or four of them of them, but none of them are near the South Pole where everybody seems to wants to go. Uh, it's also not very clear how you get in in and out of them that people propose elevators and stuff like that so uh, I think eventually we'll go to lava tubes and, and inhabit them but uh, for the places where we want to be uh, you would probably for the foreseeable future uh, stuck with something from earth that contains the the pressure and then it makes a lot of sense to to use some form of the local material uh, to protect from radiation. But it's not enough to to balance the pressure uh, on the moon for sure, where the gravity is so low. Okay. Um, one more question um, about the power. You talked about um, using solar panels, but a lot of the robots currently use also um, nuclear um, fission. And yeah. is it an option as well for like the habitats or it's simply too dangerous so we should keep it only for like unmanned machinery and robots basically? No, no, the, um, actually the, the, it's slightly there, like the, um, the ones on Voyager from like 40 years ago, <laughs> the ones on, on uh, the, the rovers on Mars, they're, they're actually, they're not fission, they're, they're, uh, they have uh, plutonium and it, it, it it's basically very hot and it loses its, oh, okay. its heat uh, and it's nuclear in that sense, but it's uh, it, uh, it's not actually like a power plant on Earth. Mm -hmm. the, the one that I uh, showed with the, the big uh, mushroom looking thing, that, that by the way is the heat rejection system for it, the, on that design. Uh, that one is, uh, I think, fission. And uh, I don't think it'd be dangerous. I, I think most of the, the thinking is that you just kind of take it like, you know, a few hundred meters away and bury it in a crater and run a cable out of it. And it's, it's the idea is that you don't have to maintain it. Nobody has to go there. Uh, it, and if, if we're, uh, we're going to do all the things that we want to do and 3D print and rove and explore, you're going to need a lot of power that you're not going to, produced by solar alone for a long time. So uh, the only way to do it, I think, is with a nuclear power plant. But, you know, we're architects uh, and, you know, there's not much 
architecture to just say like point on your master plan like nuclear power goes there and call it a day you know move on to architecture <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> no problem um, thanks a lot, Christian. Um, yeah, my, my question was, uh, how much will the finished model expected to wait? Uh, you said already 15 tons is the maximum. Um, yeah, so uh, that is um, always a, a, an important question. And, and when you're, uh, anything that goes sent to space is, is the mass is really the main currency. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's uh, everything, every system is giving an allowance and, and you have to balance it. Uh, you know, as an architect, we did our best to try to estimate it. Uh, and uh, there was a team, uh, part of the team of the uh, ESPEC of, of ESA that did the estimate. So uh, what we drew, frankly, came out to be a little bit on the heavy side uh, in their estimates. But it, this is kind of like, you know, schematic design early. So I, I wouldn't hold it to <laughs> within a few kilograms accuracy. Um, you, you can, there, there are estimates you can in the literature for what the, um, you know, life support systems weigh and things like that. So if you, but as a student architect, um, it's probably gonna take a lot of your time trying to estimate your your total mass you could i mean if you're using rhino or something you can, whatever you draw you can get the volume and and try to get the mass for the structure but that's not everything that goes in your habitat you know that all the systems weigh quite a bit too uh we came up with a 15 tonnish range for what we had drawn which is a little bit on the heavy side for taking it to the moon okay um and I had this question because I thought about wouldn't it not be better to use material which is on the moon or other planets to use this material before the humans arrive and build structures with machinery? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, you, you would you would prepare like a lot of the roads, for example, uh, your landing site. Uh, you know, foundations, stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, one of the main reasons to go there is to figure out how to do that. And, and you can you can do a lot of things robotically, but really uh, for a lot of things, you need humans to figure it out. So um, I think one of the goals of going back to the moon, to the South Pole, is to practice all the stuff that you're talking about and learn how to do it so that you could do it later. But, uh, um, you know, you could... You know, pre preparing a, a habitat that could receive humans and keep them alive using local materials, that's a really tall order to do without practicing. Uh, you know, uh, these are really intricate uh, uh, devices with lots of lots of connection, you know, parts that you, you don't need uh, in a normal house on Earth. Uh, and so uh, for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to bring a lot of that from Earth. But uh, in my mind, the, one of the principal reasons uh, to go there is to figure out all this stuff that you're talking about so we can do it, you know, in the next phase of the expansion. Okay, thank you. Cheers. But in principle, a very smart observation, because of course you would bring as little as possible from Earth and use yeah. as much as you can but it will be very little at the beginning and the goal is to be sustainable as here on earth thank you christian thank you um we have emma please yes um i was wondering if these inflatable models need some kind of air pump 24 7 and if they don't have if there's, for example, no energy for whatever reason, would they just like fall down and break down? Or is it like, do they need a maintaining? Yeah, I mean, they do need a lot of maintaining, but is it like that, like a bouncy castle when you don't have the pump, it will just <laughs> fall down or do they like harden somehow? Yeah. <laughs> no, um, so uh, it, you would uh, bring some kind of a tank 
uh, the whole the atmosphere. So when you launch it, it's it's. I guess it's not completely in vacuum because it's sitting in the rocket on Earth, but it you know not inflated. Um, when they went to uh, do the test uh, modules for uh, TransHab, and then these guys from Sierra Nevada from this year, uh, you actually need very little pressure to get it to be really rigid. So don't think of it as a bouncy castle because even even with very little pressure, and definitely when you get to uh, one atmosphere and vacuum outside, it would be solid. Um, you know, uh, the idea is that it would be as leak proof as possible, but you know, nothing is completely. So uh, you would be circulating the atmosphere all the time, just, just for the human to get rid of the carbon dioxide and, and keep everybody alive, just like at the ISS. And you might have to supplement with a little bit, but the idea is that the leak rate would be absolutely minimal. So you wouldn't, it's not like you're pumping it all the time. You would be pumping, circulating the air constantly because uh, uh, you need to do that uh, for just to keep it clean, but it's not like you have to keep blowing it up. It's not like a, on earth where you have, you know, the, the, those temporary tennis sports bubbles that you see all over the world. Those you have to keep pumping up because they're super leaky and they're, you know, they're, uh, the doors open in and out and stuff like that. Uh, so um, okay. you would have to supplement it, but don't think of it as something you have to be pumping all the time or bouncing. Okay. And and the walls will be super rigid because uh, even mm -hmm. even at like ten percent of the atmosphere, it becomes super rigid. Okay. See, and what just came to my mind when you talked about the like sustainable factor is there already like a concept how to be, um, yeah, sustainable on on Mars or on Moon like. Do they already think about what to not do because we did it wrong here on Earth, for example? Well, uh, I think one of the uh, the things that keeps me excited about uh, space architecture is that uh, because uh, the environment is so harsh and you're trying to uh, be as efficient as possible, there's a lot of you know space architecture can teach us about you know living here on Earth. Uh, on Earth, uh, you know, every building, you know, takes power from the grid and uses it and then, you know, art, out comes garbage or heat and things like that. So what if we can, uh, you know, make our buildings as closed loop as possible here? And in fact, we do have a, a project here at SOM that's not related to space architecture that we presented at uh, COP26 and actually just last week uh, at COP27. Uh, this idea that uh, what if buildings could be like trees where instead of taking resources, they're providing resources. They, and, uh, you know, that's a whole other lecture and discussion. But I, I don't think very often you see like, especially these days with uh, all the, you know, uh, billionaires going to space, you see this dichotomy like, well, why do we go to space instead of working here on Earth? And it's, it's really a false choice. Uh, we have the resources to do both, and and there's a lot to learn from designing for space that we can implement on Earth, uh, and and make our architecture here better. Um, you know, a lot of this te te technology that could be developed for there to clean the water and recycle the air efficiently uh, with the minimum amount of mat material and the minimum amount of energy can teach us a lot about how we design here on Earth as well. So. But you know, sustainability, it's not like uh, uh, these are cheap things <laughs> as well. So it's, it's not like uh, sustainable in that sense, but sustainable in the way that we could, it's not like going there, spending a, a shame amount of money, taking a few pictures and coming back. You know, it's trying to live there, learn how to live there. And I think learning how to live there can teach us a lot about how to leave, live more efficiently here on Earth. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Maria. Yes, I had a question um, about the function of the habitat. Um, you talked about like green, like making like everything green up upstairs as well and about working spaces. 
um what is actually about like people living in the habitats because i heard now that you're thinking that people first are going going to explore things so they will also like live first in this habitats probably um how many people do you actually think fits in one habitat or how is it made for how many people and um, because there are like five i saw like five floors and and each floor something else in so um yeah how should this work then so the um this the we designed this first one to be for four people uh and i i think uh looking back at all sorts of designs usually four is kind of like the limit you could put in one of these <laughs> single <laughs> launch things uh you know my uh my master's project also each of the habitat modules was for four people and and having seen a lot of student projects and, and a lot of you know non-student projects um four seems to be the right number to that you could kind of fit comfortably into something that you could launch from earth uh but the you know the idea of the moon village is that uh it, it's kind of like the iss you know it, it could be many different people going and doing different things so uh we spent our time designing one uh that would be the first one But uh, as I said, uh, you know, as as different entities arrive, they probably will have different modules. Uh, ideally, you know, you, you want to separate the functions. So you have one that's optimized to be a lab for real, uh, and one that's optimized to be a habitat, uh, you know, one that's like an entertainment thing. Uh, so uh, I think eventually that's what you want to do. Uh, we, we did in our master plan you see we started playing around with different ones uh in the in the renderings if you <laughs> really look there's yeah. some that are horizontal the uh, some that are vertical that that actually brings me a debate uh point there is a uh a big debate that you could or i don't know if it's a debate but like you could be most projects fit into uh uh either a vertical orientation where you stack them like us like what i showed or a horizontal yeah. like the seam um I personally think that horizontal works a little bit better. You can, you can, you, you the, the vertical ones kind of create these dead ends. Uh, uh, each vertical one is is a little bit of a dead end. Uh, on the Moon Village one, we did draw a hatch at the top that you could possibly be rescued by if something happens. But then you have to kind of like take a ladder down. It's a little bit iffy how that would work. A horizontal one, by definition, it's, it's a, you're a lot closer to an exit. Uh, the problem with horizontal ones, uh, if you noticed, um, is that uh, how do you how do you reconcile that you're sitting on the ground? And so that that Bigelow and that uh, Sierra Nevada ones, they are the, basically taking the trans hab and putting it on the side, so they're a complete circle, so that mm -hmm. the entrances are halfway up. So then you have to kind of either hold it up and have ladders down. Uh, On the seam project, uh, we tried to come up with a more complex geometry for the inflatable, where it's it's uh, biased towards the top, so it sits near the ground. Um, so it's, it's an interesting question, and people are exploring different ways of doing it. So, okay, but like four people is what I recommend yeah. for a single habitat. <laughs> Um, thank you. Sarah, you have a question. I have to say, I am a little bit afraid because we will not be able to answer all the questions. Um, we will go through, but I think we will want but to. Yeah, I, 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 uh, you could, Sandra, you could share my email with uh, the class and I can always follow up with questions further on as well. I'm, I'd be happy to. Thank you. If anybody had, wants. Uh, Uh, papers, uh, I can point them to things as well. And okay, to that. Oh, by the way, speaking of papers, a quick uh, plug in for the uh, 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 Space Architect website that uh, Sandra posted. I'm sure, I don't know, maybe you've told them already, but one of the uh, the most useful bits that I find about the spacearchitect.org is our uh, bibliography. If you go to bibliography, uh, there's basically every paper and book in the last 50 years that's drawn about space architecture is, is there. And most of them are available to download for free. Uh, uh, so that's a, a really good resource because, uh, you know, like every human endeavor, uh, 
you know, <laughs> there's nothing new under the sun. Chances are, whatever you're thinking about, somebody has wrote, written about it in the past. Uh, uh, and that that's not just about space architecture, right? That's my my view of life in general. Uh, so it's it's always good to to read what people have thought about these issues. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Um, okay, Sarah. Um, hi, thank you very much for an amazing lecture. Um, I was wondering, given the harsh environment and special requirements in space, um, I assume also the materials that are being used for building such um, a project are also special and therefore more expensive. So my question is how much would it cost to realize such a project or let's say maybe one module of the habitat? Uh... We did not go into the exercise of pricing, <laughs> pricing one of these. Uh, in most of the money uh, in in designing space uh, um, vehicles and things is goes into the development of them, the design of it, and testing of them. Uh, after you have it done, you know it's 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 a, you know, a lot easier to build another one and things like that. So you know, for example, Artemis, the rocket that just launched a few hours ago you know it costs billions of dollars but it's mostly because it's you know thousands of people working for 10 years to develop it uh, so that's that's a lot of the cost is there um material most of the the structure of stuff that flies into space these days is aluminum which is yeah you know, not that expensive uh i think uh, people are looking into comp various types of composites uh uh, carbon fiber reinforced polymers and things like that, which are a little bit more expensive. Um, as I, I talked about the shell a bunch of times, it's made out of all sorts of different materials. Uh, but it's it's not really the materials that are expensive. It's really all the effort goes into testing and testing and testing and, and developing the thing is, is where the expenses. And uh, of, like uh, the other thing that where the expense comes into play is the mass. Because uh, then the rocket uh, is limiting your mass, uh, and so it used to be with um, before SpaceX and, and before the last ten years that uh, you know there was like ten thousand dollars per kilogram or something. I think it's gone down uh, by quite a bit uh, by having reusable rockets, uh, and so I think th things are getting cheaper from that point of view. Uh, launching things out there. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. I think it's an interesting discussion, but it's not only the cost, it's also the benefits. Because usually as an interesting discussion is space architecture, habitability, and comfort. This has been usually always cut off the last 50 years, you know, because it's not needed. But on the long term, the question is, how much would it cost not to include it? You know, how much would it cost? What's the price if you don't include spaces where people can retreat? That can be much more expensive. So this discussion on cost benefits is super interesting, but it, it's similar to the discussion on square meters. There's, you cannot ask how much square meter does a person need. How much volume does a person need? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to um, to have a quantitative answer only. There is always a qualitative one, and this one is changing according to the culture, according to the time. But it's an important question for architects, so it's good that you asked that. Thank you. Uh, Vincent. Um, my question is, what is the main target of building a village on the moon? Um, because I read uh, about um, that in any way it's cheaper to explore other planets and um, our, our solar system when you start there. Is, this, is, is that the main target or is it all about exploring the moon or the materials? Like, so is it, this is uh, a good thing? Good question. There's uh, two interesting things to do on the South Pole on the moon, I think. Uh, one is the location itself and the material that's there. Uh, so the the idea is that uh, 
in the permanently shaded regions, you have material volatiles, water, and it's not just water, but other materials that have been there for since the formation of the, the solar system, uh, you know, for billions of years. So it's scientifically interesting from that point of view. Uh, the other thing to do on the moon is, is really practice to live there and use the resources. Um, in, in my mind, the really interesting place to go in the solar system is Mars, uh, really. And uh, Mars has uh, a lot of, uh, uh, it, it, it first uh, is the place where it seems really likely that for a long time there were uh, the same conditions on Mars as there were on Earth when life formed on Earth. And so it's, it's the one place in the solar system where we really can imagine that life might have ar arisen. Uh, and so uh, it's a really philosophically interesting place to go. Uh, and not only has it these questions, uh, potential to answer these questions about the origins of life, but it's, it's really, there's a lot more uh, stuff to do on Mars than on the moon. You know, the day is about the same. There's an atmosphere with carbon uh, that you can, uh, you know, make, uh, you know, plastics out of, uh, there's uh, water, there's a, a lot more materials to sustain a human settlement on, on the moon. Like, uh, at the moon, if you, you're not at the pole, it's so dry that we can find concrete on the moon, it'd be worthwhile mining it to get the water out of it, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, that's what the, we used to, people used to quote before we realized that there was actual water on two poles, the, the rest of it. And, uh, so in, in my mind, really, the, the place where humans could live uh, permanently uh, is Mars. The, you know, the problem with Mars is very hard to get to. And uh, in, the, in the 90s, in the first uh, decade of the, 20th cent the 21st century, everybody was talking about Mars. And, and that is the more interesting part, but it's, it's becoming obvious that it's, it's really hard to, to do. So I think everybody has kind of, for a few years, there was a big debate whether people were getting mad at each other, whether we should go to Mars or the moon, and things like that. But uh, you really, I think, uh, need to practice on the moon before going to Mars. But uh, Mars is really far more interesting to be at. It has the potential to answer a lot more deeply philosophical questions than going to the moon. Because the moon, we know for sure, it's never had the conditions to have life. And it doesn't have life. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But uh, the idea that Mars could have had life, and maybe potentially even to this day, you know, is super exciting. and. and and you can't do that with robots. Uh, you know, we've been like the, you know, how it's capable and is amazing. The robots that are there now are, you know, a, a human can do in, in a few hours uh, what they're doing in months and months. And one, one other bit about the, the debate between humans and robots is um, something that um, actually Jeff Hoffman uh, was a, former astronaut that's at MIT now that we collaborated with. Uh, he's, he, I heard it from him. I'm not sure it's the first time that he thought of it, but it's really uh, humans have a, like us here on earth that probably won't get to go to Mars, have a, a lot more engagement with when we see other humans doing stuff. Like seeing robots roving on Mars is, is not as emotionally satisfying as seeing other humans do it. You know, we're, empathetic creatures. When we see another human doing it, we imagine ourselves doing it a lot more. We're drawn to that. So the idea of sending humans is, is yeah, okay, we're a lot more efficient. We can get done, stuff done a lot faster, uh, but it's a lot more emotionally satisfying to send fellow humans and makes us feel better than you know sending robots, which is Perfect. easier and cheaper, but you know, I, I follow the robots on Mars uh, that are there to this day, but I don't know anybody else around me here that really cares about the robots on Mars. <laughs> Thanks. No problem. Thank you. Um, we have time now for two short last questions. I would suggest that uh, someone who has not yet had the chance ask a question despite of the um, who is next? 
Heidi, probably. I think Heidi or Karina have Heidi. not had the chance. Heidi, Heidi had to go already. Okay. Um, and Karina? Um, yes, I can ask a question. Yes, you have not yet had the chance, mm -hmm. please. Um, I'm also interested in the personal aspect uh, when it comes to space architecture. So um, I would like to ask a more general question. Um, what was your motiv motivation um, to choose this topic for your master thesis? And also what kind of future are you imagining? Um, do you think... The future will be the space or you a little bit answered it already you said that the innovation will come back to earth and then we will um mm -hmm. sort things out so yeah i would be interested in your idea <laughs> I, I don't know maybe it's not very original but like I, one of the first things i remember i was watching carl sagan's cosmos when i was little uh serious and that that's really turned me on into the wonders of our universe uh uh i guess that's my earliest uh memories of what got me interested in, in space and then uh sort of through life i became a architect and then it was very exciting to see that there's other architects thinking about space exploration and it's not all engineers and, and i think we've come to the, the time where architects can really make a you know a contribution to this what i was saying is before right the uh everything so far has been done by engineers where they, they start with the rocket and you put the spit and the, the human is the last thing. And what we bring as architects is that we start with, you know, what are the humans doing? What do they need? And try to wrap the technology around that. And you kind of meet in the middle. Um, so that that's kind of what gets me excited that even as, as a designer, as an architect, I can maybe someday contribute some ideas <laughs> to how humans would live in space. Um, so just general nerdiness about life in space. Would you like to live in space one day? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. I don't know if uh, I'll get to, but hopefully my kids will. Uh, we'll see. Mm. It's, it's, it's getting to be easier and easier every year. So we'll see. Okay. Thanks. Cool. It is your future. Yeah. <laughs> your future you, you will write a postcard from space to us and say hey <laughs> i remember this talk all right i'm sorry we don't have time for any more lectures so if you have any questions or um, we need to ask georgi about something please email me and um, i will help you Thank you, Georgi Petrov, very, very much, much for your um, talk, input, and for answering the questions in a very detailed manner. Beautiful. Thank you very much. And thank you, all. thank you all students for joining us. And I hope you all have a good day or a good evening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye.